This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast where we talk about serious illness, dying, death, and bereavement. I'm Marianne Matzo. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I use my experience from working as a nurse for 44 years to help answer your questions about what happens at the end of life. And I'm Charlie Navarrete, an actor in New York City, here to ask questions that may pop into your mind while listening to our podcast. We're both here because we believe that the more you know, the better prepared you are to make difficult end-of-life decisions in advance before a crisis. Please relax. Get yourself a little something de- decadent to eat and drink. <laughs> Not that relaxed. Oh, and yeah. thank you for spending the next hour with Charlie and me. In the first half, we have our recipe of the week. In the second and third half, uh-huh. we have an interview for you with Ray Ramsey, a pet communicator and psychic. So, Charlie, yeah. what are you serving today? Well, funeral potatoes. Oh, God, carbs. I love carbs. They're dead, Jim. So, funeral potatoes are... I love carbs. Star Trek? Carbs? Yeah, like, Oscar the Grouch. Like car- carburetors? Loves trash. I love carbs. Perfect. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Potatoes? You Did you say, say potatoes? Potato, and I say... Funeral potatoes. So, funeral potatoes are one of our favorite funeral lunch foods to talk about. The origins of Utah's classic casserole are murky. Most sources credit its rise in popularity to a woman's organization within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Known as a relief society, one of the group's chief responsibilities was attending to the needs of the bereaved. This, of course, included their meals. Mourners found themselves confronted by a cornflake top combination of shredded confronted? or cubed potatoes. I'm sorry. I am going to conf- I'm going to confront you with potatoes, Dag Nabbit. Were they com- confronted or comforted? Well, it depends what they were on. Um, if they had, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, visions of. Uh, Sugar plums? That's the sugar plums, fairies, and they were um, confronted by uh, cornflakes. Yeah. Want to try that again? Why not? I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) I'm on the clock. I punched in. Mourners found themselves comforted by a cornflake topped combination of shredded or cubed potatoes, cream of mushroom or mushroom soup. Sour cream, butter, and grated cheddar cheese. It's still served at post memorial gatherings and church pot. Lux. Pot Lux. Damn autocorrect. The ingredients weren't selected uh, simply because they were hearty and delicious. They were pantry staples. In fact, they're almost always inside an LDS community member's pantry a holdover from the church's post-depression push for maintaining a three-month food supply at all times. I I do that with martinis. As, (laughs) well, you never know. There could be a martini shortage one day. You never know. I Seriously, you might have to make gin in the bathtub one day. Oh, you already did. That wouldn't be that bad of a thing, I guess. Okay, something to look into. Um, as such, as such, <laughs> funeral potatoes can be prepared at a moment's notice when someone suddenly dies. Drops dead. Kicks the bucket. In fact, when Salt Lake City hosted the 2002 Winter Olympics, it not only honored the world's greatest athletes, it also honored its treasured dish. Commemorative 2002 Winter Olympic pins proudly feature funeral potatoes. Now, I just want to say mm-hmm. my birthday's coming up, Charlie. Really? And yeah, I'm I'm turning 65 and I would love one of those funeral potato pins. <laughs> what, what, wait, wait. You, you, that, you, ju- you, that just strikes my fancy in ways that I can't begin to tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say you want, what, you want one of those commemorative pins? 
With the funeral potatoes? Yes. With the funeral potatoes. I mean, how freaking bizarre is that? Um, pretty, pretty. Yeah, right? Pretty yeah. bizarre. Yes. Yeah. 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 So just saying. Okay. <laughs> well, after a death, comfort is provided by ritual and nourishment, by memories and connection, by gin and bourbon. Whenever sustenance provides you comfort in times of grief, spare a moment for a meal because you don't want to drink on an empty stomach. Amen. Yep. Please go to our webpage for the recipe and something to wash it down with, plus additional resources for this program. We hope you will follow us on Facebook and Instagram and kindly remember to rate and review this podcast. As a licensed nonprofit organization, we are dependent on the kindness of you, our listeners, and always appreciate your donations, which are tax deductible. If you find this podcast to be of help to you, please go to our webpage to donate so that we can continue to provide quality shows about serious illness, dying, death, and bereavement. Go to www.everyonedies.org. That's every, the number one, dies, dot org. Marianne? Thanks, Charles. Sure. So for our second and third half, we have an interview that I did with Ray Ramsey. Now, Ray is a fellow New Yorker like you, is a pet communicator, pet psychic. She was able to perceive information unavailable when using only your five senses. Ray, like I said, lives in New York City and is also an opera singer. Mm. So I hope you guys enjoy our interview. So today I'm going to be talking with Ray Ramsey, who's a life coach and a pet communicator. And I heard about her when I was doing an interview with Lucy Morgenstern, who I, hopefully you've listened to the interview by now, where Lucy was talking about um, rituals for pets when they die. But she talked about her friend who um, had talked with some of her pets um, during that process. And so I said, oh, you know, I really don't know anything about this, and I would love to talk with your friend and see what this is all about. So Lucy Morgenstern was kind enough to introduce me to Ray. So, Ray, thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're so welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So you're a life coach and a pet communicator, Tell us what a pet communicator is. Okay. Well, uh, you know how you can call somebody up and have a conversation? Mm -hmm. And then when you're through the conversation, you say bye-bye and you hang up. Well, it's mm -hmm. not that different. Because really? what I do is to uh, communicate, but in a way that uh, I call it telepathic. Uh, it can be called many uh, different different things, but it really is non uh, verbal communication. And so if I'm going to talk to an animal, I'll, of course, uh, first talk to the person. And when I connect with the, the uh, animal, uh, I, will, uh, I will just do it silently. And I do it by picturing and by thinking words. And the animal, nine times out of ten, or maybe ten out of ten, 99% uh, of, of the way, will get that. And, uh, and so it, there's usually an issue that needs to be discussed, and, the, the, of course, the person is on the phone, and so that issue is probably affecting the person's life. And so what I do is to do something very similar to what you would do uh, in a therapy session, I, I ask them uh, what it, what is going on and how do you feel about it and kind of get it into it that way. And mm -hmm. so it does become a three-way conversation because I'm talking to the person and the animal. Mm -hmm. So is a pet communicator and a pet psychic the same thing? Well, th those are different way, ways of referring to someone who communicates uh, telepathically or silently with animals without using mm -hmm. spoken words, yes. Now, can you do the same thing with people? Uh, I'm very, very intuitive with people, but mm -hmm. I don't practice that with people. I, uh, there's no need to um, because I can either 
uh, we can either get together and talk or we can talk on the phone. Uh, so I, I don't have that need because we have a, a shared language unless I'm working with someone who speaks a different language. Uh, so, uh, but with the animals, uh, I, I, do, I do it silently. You, you wouldn't, if we were doing a, uh, a communication today, you wouldn't mm -hmm. hear anything. When I, I might say, well, Marianne, let me pose that question to, uh, to Sweetie Pie. Mm -hmm. and, and then you'll just hear silence. And during that silence, I will be, uh, I will be talking silently to the, uh, to the animal. And I think words, and, uh, and I, um, I feel the emotions that the person or the animal is feeling. And mm -hmm. so that, that helps a lot. So does that answer your question or yeah. do you need more? Yeah. No. What, when were you aware, how old were you, when you were aware that you could hear animals speak? I love that question. <laughs> I, I learned probably when I was in kindergarten or before. I don't, I don't remember exactly that. But, uh, but I lived in a, a, a town in Michigan. And it was a really. I'm from Michigan. Where, where where did you live? No. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness! I am from East Lansing, Michigan. Oh, okay. I was from Lincoln Park, which was, you know, the suburbs they built after World War II. Yeah, Lincoln down Park in, around Detroit, or yeah, like about 15 minutes south of Detroit. Oh, for goodness sake! Oh, that's just amazing. So two well, Michigan girls, anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. Well, we. I mean, we have to pause to to delight in this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So that's, you know, I just, I just uh, when I was growing up in East Lansing, uh, I was in a neighborhood where there was a, uh, a cat lady, and she had about 30 cats. And mm -hmm. I didn't think it was weird, weird at all, and my father would take us over there when, when we'd go on these walks, and I would, I would just go crazy over the animals. And so what I found from that was that I could tell what they wanted and what they were saying, and why they were sad. And so I picked up both words and emotions. And, um, and that's, that's how it started out. But then as it developed, then I would, uh, I would actually focus on a specific issue, and that would be the reason for the call. And now, did, when that happened when you were pre-K or kindergarten, did you tell your parents? Yes, I did, and they were very open-minded. However, that's that's a very good point because um, uh, I I decided not to tell my friends because mm -hmm. I just knew they would think it was weird. And mm -hmm. being weird when you're in kindergarten, that'll follow you through grade school and high school <laughs> and yeah. all that. And I didn't want people to to make fun of me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did tell. Uh, I remember I, I had a best friend in first grade, and we were walking along the street one day, and I said, I have a secret to tell you, and that was the secret. Oh. And she took it very well. So, but I chose her to tell. Mm -hmm. so, um, and I don't tell everybody uh, even now, because many people cannot get that, and they just think I'm a weirdo. And that, that's fine. I can, I can handle that. But, um, but that gets in the way of their using my talents to help mm -hmm. their animals. I see. Now, are yeah. you able to talk to both living and dead animals? Yes, I am. So can you tell me more about how do you talk with a dead animal? Well, really, just about the way I, I talk with a live, uh, a live person or a live animal, because mm -hmm. we're all sp spirits, and there's usually an issue to discuss, and that issue sometimes is, is why did you die so suddenly? Or, or uh, why, what was wrong with your leg? Those things that, that have affected the animal and the person. Mm -hmm. And so I will just either, uh, I'll say it to them in my mind. Uh, I won't say it out loud to the person, but you know, I, I, the person knows I'm going to ask that question or say that thing to the animal, and so uh, it's silent. I, I, uh, I, I speak uh, silently, and mm -hmm. the conversation starts. And you know, I do the same thing that we would do if um, we, if we met in a in a gathering. You know, I would introduce myself, and we might get into what we do and everything, and so that's. Uh, that's pretty much the way it happens. It happens a little differently 
uh, each time because the animal is a little different. Sometimes they're reticent uh, at, at first, and sometimes you can't shut them up. They're just <laughs> talking, talk, 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 talk. <laughs> and I love both of those states. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's how I do it. I, I do it in English, and uh, I could haltingly do it in a couple of other languages, but I, I, I usually just speak English when I'm doing an animal communication. So when I was talking with Lucy, she was saying that she had, I think it was two cats at separate times, that mm-hmm. she questioned whether or not um, to euthanize them because they were they were very sick. And she said that mm-hmm. she called you and mm-hmm. you talked with the cats and they mm-hmm. said they didn't want to be euthanized, that they wanted to die at home. Mm-hmm. Have, you, yeah. have you had pets that said, no, I just, I'm ready to go, just have me euthanize, or do most say, I'd rather just go home? I would say uh, that, that most uh, would, uh, would make the choice uh, to, to stay, to stay on this plane, uh, on this plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but many will say, no, I'm ready to go, and that has happened uh, not as often as as uh, wanting to stay, but it does happen. And so mm-hmm. I can handle either state because if they want to go and they, they're in a lot of pain, and that's, that's why a lot of us want to go, of course. And uh, so if they're in a lot of pain, uh, that may be the reason, but it also may be because they miss someone, uh, a human, who who lived their life with this animal and they they don't see any purpose in their lives anymore mm-hmm. and so that's why it can be very helpful because uh in talking to the animal they may decide that oh well i do have something to live for so it just depends on the uh the situation with that particular animal so one of the things that kind of bridges me to something that i was thinking about and mm-hmm. um, I met my now husband about two years ago and his mm-hmm. wife had died two years before that mm-hmm. and he had an Australian shepherd named Dimple Rose and Dimple mm-hmm. when I met her was she didn't give off a happy vibe if you know what I mean mm-hmm. um, she would walk only short distances for a walk and Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, she must really be grieving. Do dogs grieve for their owners? Absolutely. Yes, and so do cats. Sometimes sometimes to the point of just dying, you know, just dying really? on their own. Yes, yes, definitely. And, and there, I think they've written operas about those things, about people losing their loves mm-hmm. and then choosing to die. I'm an opera singer, so... <laughs> Really? I re- yeah, I relate. I don't do it anymore, but I, I relate everything to to the drama of opera. So, yeah. So, how do you know then if your pet is grieving? Well, some of the same things happen that happen with us. Uh, they may not uh, eat very well, or they may not eat at all. Um, they um, sometimes they'll cry out in their sleep. Uh, they they uh, they carry themselves like like a human would carry themselves when they when they don't uh, feel happy. Mm-hmm. So they're they're the physical signs, and then you you know you can walk into a, a room and look around meet meet several people, and then you see somebody across the room, and you know that they're in trouble. You know mm-hmm. they're unhappy, and so that can happen with animals as well. And so, how do you help an animal with grief? Like if you were working with an animal, what would you do? Uh huh. Well, uh, I would work with the animal uh, not very differently than I would work with a person, and that that means that I will first first of all I will just listen, tell them, ask them to tell me uh, tell me how it happened, tell me how they feel, just to so that they can be heard. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I'm getting information that will help me to help them. So, uh, so I will do that. I, I also have a, um, a sense 
that uh, even if they don't say anything, I have a sense as to uh, how they're what what emotional state they're in. Because mm-hmm. not not everybody feels uh, sad or depressed when they lose an animal. Sometimes it was so hard uh, for so long that they're happy that the animal is now on the other side, mm-hmm. or however they they would uh, put that. So, so does that then, answer the question? Or well, how do you, so, so? Let's say like with Dimple Rose. If she was sad or she was depressed or she was grieving, mm-hmm. does does a chat with you help her? Or is it one of those things like for people where it's like therapy sessions over time? Mm-hmm. And also we always say to people, well, you're not going to ever, you know, quote, unquote, get over your grief. You'll learn kind of to adapt and to live with it Mm -hmm. and is that also the same for animals is that say that again the the last part well is it also the same for animals that they don't ever get over their grief okay um again that's uh that's an individual situation Mm -hmm. Uh, i do believe that people and animals do get over their grief but i wouldn't uh, I wouldn't approach uh, a session that way or approach a person or an animal that way. Mm-hmm. But the, the main thing is that I'm present for them. Very, very important to know that there's, a, there's another sentient being listening to you and, and empathizing with you. So that's, that's uh, very, very important. And um, so I, I, uh, I, will, I will listen and... Sometimes they'll just cry out, and you won't hear it as a human being, but I'm hearing it. I'm getting it. And mm-hmm. they'll, they'll cry out, or they'll, uh, they'll say, I don't want to live anymore. All the things that we say, we feel mm-hmm. when we lose somebody, that is possible for the, the animals as well. And not all animals uh, react exactly the same. And so... Does it take a series of sessions then for them to work that through? Yes, sometimes. And mm-hmm. uh, sometimes it actually, they can let go of it in that session. Really? I would say, yeah, yeah. Animals are, uh, they're not as complex in a sense as we are, mm-hmm. although mm-hmm. I say that with reservations. But, uh, but they, they, will, um, they will feel that a, a weight has lifted. Very often mm-hmm. I hear that, that it's, oh, I feel so much lighter, or, oh, I, I, I haven't felt this good for so long. You mm-hmm. know, the, they will make a comment about that. So it depends on the animal as it depends on the person. And it may take a few sessions, but, but not always. Sometimes that it just letting go and, and uh, somebody really hearing your pain and hearing your your grief mm-hmm. uh and and we're all that way aren't we i mean we, mm, when you yes. talk you know if it's a therapist or a, a friend or um or your husband or your wife uh it it lifts a burden and mm-hmm. it can of course come back but uh but it may be lighter the next time mm-hmm. so it it's very i just feel that one of the most beautiful gifts we can give each other is is to listen. And so I I work uh, that way with animals as I do with people. So for those of us who aren't pet communicators, can we sit with a grieving pet and talk our own English and and would they understand us? Uh, Yes. I'll, I'll, because they're really uh, they're getting your feelings and um, and your emotions and uh, it, let's say if you're you're offering a lot of uh, emotional support they will get that support it, it will come across very much like it would uh, with us if I were really depressed about something and I told my husband about it that he mm-hmm. would probably lift it by listening to me. I see. So one of the things that 
our listeners can realize is that kind of talking with their pet about loss or grief, if somebody mm-hmm. in their family has died, mm-hmm. will help the pet understand. Does that sound, do I have that right? Well, uh, yes, that's one, one way, but if uh, just by, um, by telling them that you, you, uh, you're feeling the, the pain that they're feeling, Mm-hmm. And that you wish you could lift it, and you love them, and you know, if, let's say they've lost their their best furry friend, uh, that you uh, you will tell them that that uh, you're with them, and and you're so sorry that you know all the things that you would say to a person, mm-hmm. and th- those emotions will come across to the anim- animals, not necessarily the words. It okay. depends on the human and the animal. Mm-hmm. So in your sessions that you've had with pets, can you tell us any stories about interactions that you've had with pets and what happened? Uh, Yes, I I can. Um, I was reading over a lot of my uh, my notes from working with with people and their pets and, uh, and you know, there's. I've had as many experiences as one can have with this sort of work. So, um, would you want to focus on like one uh, one event or one one uh, set of feelings, or how would you want to do that? Gosh, you know, I I don't feel I don't know. Why don't what what do you think would be the most interesting and sort of educational story for our listeners to hear in terms of this idea of grief and loss and Mm -hmm. maybe euthanasia because Mm -hmm. you know that we do our we do talk mostly about dying and death in this program so yes right okay so um i have a client uh who uh actually lost both of her cats in the last couple of years mm-hmm. and the second one uh, she lost very uh, very recently mm. and uh, she um, she felt very sad but um, but I was of course uh, doing the work of a communicator and a supporter and and so uh, so I asked the uh, I asked the cat some questions and and uh, just offered uh, sympathy and and support in hearing the the answers and and sometimes uh, an animal specifically misses uh, sitting with with another animal or um, or chasing each other around the house mm-hmm. or um, or you know if you're a dog you're, you uh, all those long walks that you took together with your mm-hmm. your human and so it there are things that uh, that made you happy uh, in this life when they were here, but when the animal leaves, uh, then you feel a hole in your life. Mm-hmm. And animals animals feel that that too. So um, this this one uh, this one cat that lost her her friend, um, I I just asked her to to tell me about what what. Uh, what was missing in her life now, and uh, and and how uh, how did how did she feel when she was going through the death of of the animal, mm-hmm. and um, and so there I helped them kind of to relive the pain so that it can lift, and it won't always lift at that time, but there's an opportunity for it to live, and most people feel uh, better after. Uh, after they have had a session with me. And most animals feel better as well. So what did this cat say in terms of what she or he was feeling when her companion was dying? Well, um, the one that I'm thinking of, uh, I, I worked with her with, with the, the animal after her, her companion died. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was, I wasn't going through the, the death process with her, uh, but um, but I, again, I asked I, I asked her how that made her feel, 
mm-hmm. and very often uh, the animal will will cry out. You're not going to hear it, and nobody in the room will, will hear it, but I'll get it. And so they're uh, they're in a state where they need to let emotion go. They need to cry out, mm-hmm. and so they can do that. And it's it's uh, it it's silent to us uh, unless you're doing the work that I'm doing. Uh, it's silent to us, but uh, but it's it's real for them in that they're letting out emotion and they're revisiting uh, a, a, a very difficult situation where they lose they they lost their friend because it it often is a, a great friend and sometimes the only animal friend that that animal had. Right. So so is it more of a raw emotion or are there actual words? in terms of this is how I felt? Uh, it can be both. And uh, mm-hmm. the raw emotion will be crying out or mm-hmm. just crying and not necessarily uh, something you could see as a bystander, but I, I hear it, I feel it. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's that uh, that, that uh, comes across to me. And, uh, and what was your, the other part of your question? Um, well, do they actually use words, too, to, to oh. verbalize how they're feeling? Yes, or they do. Just, okay. Yeah, and they so do what use. This, did this cat use words? Like, what did she have to say? Well, I I asked her what she missed most about mm-hmm. her friend, and she said, "Well, we always slept together, and now I I don't have a a friend to sleep with me anymore. That they had mm-hmm. the person, but not not the animal. And mm-hmm. so I I miss her. I feel there's there's something." missing in my life and it is missing in my life because she's mm-hmm. not here anymore and and sometimes they will cry out and i hear it you you wouldn't hear it or somebody else wouldn't hear it but i hear it i get it and this is like oh how how will i live how will i live we were always together we were sisters mm-hmm. or we were brothers and i how can i go on like like She's not going to come back. I just want to die myself. You know, so it's that kind of uh, feeling that, you know, that has been written into operas and plays and, and uh, the emotions of loss. Wow. And so the words can, can uh, take different forms, but the emotion of great loss. And I, I can... Uh, if I want to revisit the loss of my animals, I can go back to those emotions, and they're they're all still there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it can come across in uh, in just emotions, or it can come across in words, which sometimes turn into very heavy emotions. I see. So, with your own pets. Um, do you know what they're thinking and what they want to say to you all the time? <laughs> uh, oh, that's such a wonderful question. Uh, I I know uh, I know intuitively um, pretty much what my animals say uh, say to me, and they they talk to me a lot, and they mm-hmm. they talk through their their language. I have two cats, and um, but they also. Uh, They'll they'll come up to me and look, and just glare at me in in the eyes, and <laughs> <laughs> you probably had that. <laughs> this has come up and say, "What are you doing?" You know, it's, it, it's it's like I thought you were done with that, and or you know, don't you see how miserable I am? It's that kind of thing that um, that I translate into words, and they're the words that we would use as mm-hmm. human beings. Uh, so and and sometimes uh, an animal just gets depressed, and it takes a bit, uh, a bit of time and several sessions sometimes to get to the bottom of the of the grief. See, I do that with with our pets and with Dimple Rose. She's she, like I said, she's a very mm-hmm. spoiled Australian Shepherd who was, you know, the only child and did everything mm-hmm. with her mom, and mm-hmm. so she, I've given her the persona of like somebody from Woodward Avenue in Detroit, you know, she's, uh-huh. she's really tough and doesn't <laughs> miss words. <laughs> she's a big, uh, big dog around town. Huh? <laughs> Watch I'll, out, I'll, she's here. <laughs> and I'll have her like say things to my husband and then I'll look at him and I'll say, you can let her talk to you that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. 
Oh, he sounds pretty good at it, too. <laughs> oh, dear. I promise never to tell anybody about this. <laughs> so I have these, you know, like personas that I've that I've given the pets. I don't know if they're right or not, but they they seem to, you know, reflect their, mm-hmm. you know, their attitudes, you know, because they mm-hmm. like especially Dimple has. You know, like once dinner is over, she's like trying to hurt us to bed because she's ready to go to bed. And the other night I was up late working on a class and she just like comes to my office and starts barking at me. I said, girlfriend, you know, you want to go to bed, you go to bed, but you leave me alone. (laughs) We're having an (laughs) argument. (laughs) Well, of course. And then did she she kind of slither off with the No. No? No. She's like, And then she lays down on the floor and glares at me. Uh huh. She's not going to back off. <laughs> oh, oh, that is a, that's kind of a harumph, you know. Like, yes. All right, I'll sit here, but you know, you're going to pay for it later. Yeah, I'm going to stare <laughs> at you. Yeah, and she right. swears all the time. I mean, she's just, you know, she's. Oh my goodness. Oh, but that I don't. Adorable. Well, I don't know if that's really her persona or just, you know, I'm projecting onto her, but. Um, I, I tend to do that with animals, so maybe I'm a uh, pet communicator or something too. <laughs> you, well, you sound like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you you know you love animals, obviously, and uh, and and you've already had some experience getting their emotions and their um, their feelings and all that, and um, and you could develop that definitely, and and uh, and I think you would really enjoy it. I I did training. I didn't really feel a need to do training, but I met somebody who was um, uh, just a very special person, and so I, I did some training, and, mm-hmm. uh, and you, you, can, you can do that, and uh, mm. yeah, this, you know, you don't hear about it and, unless you're really interested in doing it, and then you, then you do hear about it, so, um, so I, I train with, uh, with several uh, communicator teachers. Mm-hmm. And and it, it it helped because it it's kind of a shortcut to to being able to and and also um, a shortcut but, but also uh, a uh, a way of of testing out your your development and I see. yeah just uh, being able to to run things by people in the class and, and the teacher and all that mm-hmm. yeah yeah. Well, I kind of did with Dimple what I would do with my patients in terms of, you know, she had this sudden sudden loss of her mom. You know, it was very quick. Mm-hmm. And um, okay. I talked with her about it and um, rambled on and on. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's taken her, took her a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what I've noticed over time is like she started this summer, for example, after she eats her breakfast, she comes and runs and jumps on the bed and snuggles up with me. Mm-hmm. And I said to David, I said, did she do that with Stacia? And he's like, yeah, I guess she did. But mm-hmm. it was a year and a half after I met her that she started to do that, you know? Mm-hmm. So she's kind of, um, I guess, I don't know, more and more trusting or willing to love again. I don't know what the, I don't know what it is personally yeah. because I really can't communicate her. But you know, that's what the feeling I have is is that like, well, all right, seems like you're not going anywhere, so I guess I'll love you. <laughs> oh, oh, isn't that so sweet? But you know, trust yourself uh, because uh, if you feel it, you're you're picking up their feelings, and mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, I think we in the society talk about, well, I'm just projecting my own feelings and all that. But no, it's, it's, uh, it's real. This is, this is real. So I'm, I'm glad that you have had that experience. Yeah. Well, it's been fun. And I'm so yeah. glad that you took the time out of your, your day to, to talk with us because I think this is an interesting thing for people to know. And even if mm-hmm. you, they don't talk to a pet communicator, but you can, when somebody dies, talk to the pet about, here's what happened, or that was really scary, or yeah, they, didn't, yeah. they didn't leave because they didn't love you. They left because they had to, you know, and mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. let them know that they'll still be cared for, they'll still be loved, but mm-hmm. not by that person. Do you think yeah, I have that and, right? Yes, exactly. You know, if you were talking to a, an animal who had lost his, his uh, friend, you, you could say those exact words, and mm-hmm. they will get the feeling. They won't necessarily get, you know, all the English and all that, but they will get the feeling and they'll get the support. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's very, very key because they, they do need, just like we do, uh, support when they have a loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, right. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, if you want to um, contact Ray, her um, business address is Ray Ramsey. It's R-A-E-R-A-M-S-E-Y all one word, no space, at yahoo.com. That's Ray yes. Ramsey at yahoo.com. So, Ray, thank you oh. Oh, for visiting with me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, and, and thank you, and I wish you well. This is a wonderful thing that you're doing. So oh, thank, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me, yes. Please stay tuned for the continuing saga of Everyone Dies. And thank you for listening. Like sand through an hourglass. So are the raindrops through a torn umbrella. I don't get the metaphor either. And I wrote it. This is Charlie Navarrete with the insight of Agnes Lee Turnbull. Dogs' lives are too short. Their only fault, really. And I'm Marianne Matso. And we'll see you next week. Remember, funeral potatoes are more than food. They are love. And every day is a gift. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.